Hi, this is Eric Michael Lloyd. I want to read the uh, continue reading the book Don't Be Evil. This book was written by Rana Furuhar, Financial Times business columnist and author of Makers and Takers. This book was published in 2019. We we'll start at chapter one. So I read the author's note previous to this video, prior to this video. Chapter 1, A Summary of the Case Don't be evil is the famous first line of Google's original code of conduct. With, uh, what seems today like a quaint relic of the company's early days, when the crayon colors of the Google logo still conveyed the cheerful, idealistic spirit of the enterprise. <clears throat> How long ago that feels. Of course, it would be unfair to accuse Google of being actively evil. But evil is as evil does, and some of the things that Google and other big tech firms have done in recent years have not been very nice. When Larry Page and Sergey Brin first dreamed up the idea for Google as Sanford graduate students, they probably didn't imagine that the shiny apple of knowledge that was their search engine would ever get anyone expelled from paradise, as many Google executives have been over a variety of scandals in recent years. Nor could they have predicted the many embarrassments that would emanate from the Googleplex, Google doctoring its algorithms in ways that would that would deep six rivals of the crucial first page of its search results. Google's YouTube hosting instructional videos on how to build a bomb. Google selling ads to Russian agents, granting them the use of of the platform to spread misinformation and manipulate the 2016 US presidential election. Google, working on a potential search engine for China, one that would be compliant with the regime's efforts to censor unwelcome results. Former Google CEO Eric Schmidt, leaving his position as executive chairman of Google's parent company, Alphabet, a few months after the New York Times revealed they'd been unduly influencing antitrust policy work at the think tank that both his family foundation and Google itself supported, going so far as to publish the firing of a policy analyst who dared to speculate about whether Google might be engaging in anti-competitive practices, something that Smith, Smith has denied. In May 2019, Smith announced he would be stepping down from the alphabet board as well. <clears throat> All of this may not exactly be evil, but certainly is worrisome. Google's true sin, like that of many Silicon Valley behemoths, may simply be hubris. The company's top brass always wanted it to be big enough to set its own rules, and that has been its downfall just as it has been for many big tech firms. But this is not a book about Google alone. It is a book about how today's most powerful companies are bifurcating our economy, corrupting our political process, and fogging our minds. When Google will often stand as the poster child for the industry more generally, this book will also cover the other four FAANGs, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and Netflix, as well as a number of additional platform grant giants like Uber that have come to dominate their respective spaces in the technology industry. I'll also touch on the ways that a variety of older companies from IBM to GM are evolving in response to these new challenges. And I will look at the rise of a new generation of Chinese tech giants that is 
going where even the F-A-A-N-G's don't dare. Or fangs don't dare. While there are plenty of companies both in Silicon Valley and elsewhere that illustrate the upsides and downsides of digital transformation, the big technology platform firms have been the chief beneficiaries of the epic digital transformation we, under, we are undergoing. They have replaced the industrialism of the 19th and 20th centuries with the information-based economy that has come to define the 21st. The implications are myriad, and I will track many of them, often via the Google narrative which has been the marker for larger industry-wide shifts. Google has, after all, been the pioneer of big data, targeting advertising, and the type of surveillance capitalism that this book will cover. It was following the move fast and break things ethos long before Facebook. <clears throat> I've been following the company for, many, for over 20 years, and I first encountered the celebrated Google founders, Page and Bryn, not in the Valley, but in Davos, the Swiss gathering spot of the global power elite, where they'd taken over a small chalet to meet with a select group of media. The year was 2007. The company had just purchased YouTube a few months back, and it seemed eager to convince skeptical journalists but this acquisition wasn't yet another death blow to copyright, paid content creation, and the viability of the news publications for which we worked. Unlike the buttoned up, unlike the buttoned up consulting types from McKinsey and BCG, or the suited executives from the old guard multinational corporations that roamed the promenades of Davos, their tasseled loafers slipping on the icy paths, the Googlers were the cool bunch. They, were, they wore fashionable sneakers and their shadow was sleek, white and stark, with giant cubes masquerading as chairs in a space that looked as though it had been repurposed that morning by designers flown in from the valley. In fact, it may have been, and if so, Google wouldn't have been alone in such excess. I remember attending a party once in the Davos, in Davos, hosted by Napster founder and former Facebook president Sean Parker. It featured giant taxidermy bears and musical mus musical performance by John Legend. Back in the Google chalet. Brennan Page projected a youth, youthful earnestness as they explained the company's involvement in its, Austri in its involvement in authoritarian China and insisted they'd never be like Microsoft, which was considered the corporate bully and monopolist of the time. What about the future of news, you wanted to know? After admitting that Page read only free news online, whereas Bryn often bought the Sunday New York Times in print, it's nice, he said cheerfully. The duo affirmed exactly what we journalists wanted to hear. Google, they assured us, would never threaten our livelihoods. <clears throat> yes, advertisers were indeed migrating en masse from our publications to the web where they could target consumers with a level of precision that the print world would barely imagine. But not to worry. Google would generously retool our business model so we, too, could thrive in a new digital world. I was much younger then, and not yet the admittedly cynical business journalist I have become, and yet I still listen to that happy future of news lecture with some skepticism. Whether Google actually intended to 
to develop some brilliant new revenue model or not, what alarmed me was that none of us were asking a far more important question. Sitting toward the back of the room, somewhat conscious of my relatively junior status, I hesitated waiting until the final moments of the meeting before raising my hand. Excuse me, I said. We're talking about all of this like journalism is the only thing that matters. But isn't this really about democracy? If newspapers and magazines are all driven out of business by Google or companies like it, I asked, how are people going to find out what's going on? <clears throat> Larry Page looked at me with an odd expression, as if he was surprised that someone should be asking such a naive question. Oh yes, we've got a lot of people thinking about that. Not to worry, his tone seemed to say, Google had the engineers working on that democracy problem. Next question? Well, it turns out that we did have to worry about democracy. And since November 2016, we have had to worry about it a lot more. And it's impossible to ignore the obvious. As tech firms have become inexorably more powerful, our democracy has become more precarious. Newspapers and magazines have been hollowed out by Google and Facebook, which in 2018 together took 60% of the internet advertising market. 60%. This is a key reason for the shuttering of some 1800 newspapers between 2004 and 2018, a process that has left 200 com countries with no paper at all, restricting the supply of reliable information that is the oxygen of democracy. And given that digital advertising surpassed TV ads in 2017, it's clear that TV news will be the next to go. While cable news may have gotten a Trump bump, in recent years, the longer term trend line is clear. TV will ultimately be disintermediated by big tech, just the way print media has been. But the trouble with big tech isn't just an economic and business issue. It has political and cognitive implications as well. Often, these trends are written about in isolation, but in fact, they are deeply intertwined. In this book, my goal is to connect the dots, to tell the whole story, which is far bigger than the sum of its parts. Things Fall Apart, The Political Impact of Big Tech. After it was revealed that the largest technology platforms in the world were exploited by Russian state actors and their private proxies to swing the 2016 U.S. presidential election, it was Facebook, not Google, who took most of the heat. CEO Mark Zuckerberg insistently denied the possibility that nefarious foreign actors could have hacked the platform, which, of course, is exactly what was revealed to have happened. As the New York Times later reported, both he and the COO, Sheryl Sandberg, had enlisted a shadowy right-viewing PR firm that used underhanded techniques to discredit the big tech critic and financier George Soros. Google was only marginally more responsive to those first signs of election manipulations in the wake of 2016, and it turned out to have played a major role as well. Its subsidiary, YouTube, was a host to much of the pre-election hate that was stirred up by actors both abroad, including the same Russian agents that were active on Facebook and at home. The 2016 election, Brexit, and the continued role that Russia plays in online disinformation underscore the fact that the very cohesion of society is at stake in this new digital revolution. 
We are experiencing a crisis of trust in this country. We've lost faith in our institutions, our leaders, and the very systems by which society is governed. As, a, as tempting as it might be to point a finger straight at the White House, this is not all about the current administration. One, research shows that the declining trust in liberal democracy has coincided with the rise of social media. Part of this has to do with the fake news problem, which academic studies have found is 70% more likely to be shared than real news. 70%. But the fall in trust also has to do with a sense that the game is rigged and that there is now an even wider social and economic chasm dividing the haves and have-nots, a divide created not just by Wall Street, but by Silicon Valley too. In 2008, Washington bailed out the largest and most powerful banks and left ordinary homeowners to take losses. We can argue about the economic rationale for this, but the political result was the emergence of a narrative the system had been captured by a small group of rich and powerful people. It drove voters on ends of on both ends of the spectrum away from the Republican and Democratic centers as a result. Now, just as the public fury at Wall Street after the 2008 crisis contributed to the populist backlash that led to Donald Trump, the sense that Silicon Valley is building robots instead of factories and creating paper billionaires instead of jobs is now fueling extremism on both ends of the political spectrum. From the rise of fascism among white men in red states to socialism among angry young millennials in the blue states. Feelings that are, of course, aired and fanned on the very technology platforms that have helped to fuel them. When you stop to think about it, it's not so surprising that a growing number of experts believe that it was tech-based disruption as much as trade that pushed the American Rust Belt toward Donald Trump. There is no question that the tech sector has spawned incredible economic bifurcation. A 2016 report by Economic Innovation revealed that a mere 75 of America's 3,000 plus counties make up 50% of all new job growth. These are the places where big tech looms large. San Francisco, Austin, Palo Alto, and so on. The cities where the large tech firms locate, create wealth, but iPhone uh, it says pages 9 and 10 are not shown in this preview. It goes to the next page, which is page 11. It says, iPhone during investigations of 2015 San Bernardino terrorist attack. But in China, things are different. In Beijing forced the company to move all of its iCloud data centers for Chinese customers to the mainland, where they would be run by a local company that doesn't need to comply with U.S. laws about data protection, Apple quickly acquiesced, showing that there are limits to its philosophy of preserving civil liberties when there are true threats to its business model in key markets. Even Netflix, which is in some ways the Teflon F-A-A-N-G fang, one that comes in for less criticism because of a subscription business model focused on less sensitive data about our entertainment preferences, has vowed to foreign censors. In early January 2019, it emerged that Netflix had pulled an episode of its popular comedy, Patriot Act, in Saudi Arabia after, a, after government officials complained about one of the actors on the show criticizing Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman for his role in the murder of Saudi dissident Jamal Khashoggi and for the Saudi war atrocities in Yemen. Meanwhile, 
big tech is taking on the role of big brother right here in the United States, working with local, state, and national authorities to create what is starting to look like a, like a surveillance nation. Amazon sells facial recognition technology to the police. Palantir, the big data firm co-founded by PayPal entrepreneur Peter Thiel, works with the LAPD to target citizens in an alarming manner that might have been drawn from the dystopian thriller, thriller Minority Report. <laughs> what else? What else that data might be used for is anyone's guess. The clandestine nature of it all makes it nearly impossible to track. But the result is that little by little, American democracy has ceded a bit more ground to big tech. Regulators are finally beginning to turn their attention to these issues. In the summer of 2019, as this book goes to press, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Apple are being investigated by the Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission, FTC. The House of Representatives Antitrust Subcommittee is taking action, too, with plans for months of hearings on big tech. But I doubt that the problems will be resolved in time for the 2020 elections, if at all. Despite their professed and politicized outrage about Google and Facebook allegedly manipulating their algorithms in favor of liberal politicians, liberal politicians, most Republicans are reluctant to touch the issue in a serious way, because to do so would question the legitimacy of the Trump presidency, given the Russian election meddling on his behalf via the same platforms. Liberals, on the other hand, are divided. And that their attitudes toward big in their attitudes toward big tech, the corporate wing of the party, made up of representatives such as Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, believes in self-regulation for Silicon Valley, just as he does for the big banks of his home state. It's telling Schumer. It's telling that Schumer was one of the politicians Facebook tapped in its efforts to limit the fallout over its involvement in election manipulation. And Schumer was only too happy to comply. Advising colleagues like the prominent Facebook critic Senator Mark Warren, who toned down their criticism of the company, coincidentally or not, Schumer's daughter works at Facebook. The progressive wing is more inclined to take on Silicon Valley, as are it should be said, some free market conservatives who don't ally with Trump and a number of 2020 Democratic candidates have made it a key platform issue. But making changes to the industry will be complicated and require retooling of many diverse rules and regulations that are supported or opposed by a jumble of disparate interest groups. Meanwhile, the titans of big tech who are often accused of being disproportionately liberal, they are really more libertarian, are busy throwing support to whichever party will best serve their interests. Former Google CEO Eric Schmidt, for example, gives to Democrats and Republicans, is friendly with the Trump administration, and sat on the Department of Defense Innovation Board under the Obama and Trump presidencies. Schmidt was also a key advisor in the digital efforts for both the Obama and Hillary Clinton campaign, using Google's might to help the former get elected and exerting policy influence afterward that is worrisome to say the least. While this obviously isn't problematic in the same way that allowing the Trump campaign to spread racist dog whistles and fake news during the 2016 election was, it underscores the point that these companies hold undue influence over our political system as a whole in ways that undermine public trust. Schmidt is certainly not alone in playing both sides of the political fence. Take a look at the first meeting of Silicon Valley's tech giants with Donald Trump 
2017. And you'll see Sheryl Sandberg, Tim Cook, and many other avowed Democrats leaning to the president, literally. Despite Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos' ownership of the Washington Post, which is often criticized, critical of the president, Amazon pushed its facial recognition technology to ICE, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's Immigration and Customs Enforcement Division, the very one that was keeping children in cages at the Mexican border. Most Democrats and an increasing number of Republicans have been bought out by big tech's extensive lobbying. Silicon Valley is onto a good thing, and naturally enough, they want to keep it going, which is why they've been silently upgrading their lobbying presence in Washington, both overtly and covertly. If you combine IT, electronics, and platform technologies, big tech is now the second largest lobbying group in our nation's capital, right behind big pharma, with Google's parent company, Alphabet, frequently weighing in as the single largest individual corporate lobbyist in Washington. Google emerged as the most influential corporate lobbyist and the one to get more face time from the White House than any other corporate entity during Barack Obama's second term, just as big tech was emerging as what criminal investigators term a subject of interest. That's when Google, Facebook, and other big tech firms began to blanket an unlikely assortment of interest groups with money. The American Library Association, the American Association of People with Disabilities, the National Hispanic Media Coalition, and the Center for American Progress, for example, may not seem like natural allies of the tech revolution, but they have supported some of the regulatory loopholes that big tech firms enjoy, including rules that shield them from liability for what users say and do online. These groups might have reason to object to these tech behemoths on various policy issues, but the heavy donations from their Silicon Valley benefactors often garner tacit support and sometimes outright endorsement. The ALA, for example, unlike many other groups that represent authors and publishers, supported Google in its fight for the right to scan the, all the world's books. And while it's true that librarians generally support free speech and want books to be widely accessible, it's also true that Google gives the ALA money and has worked closely with them on various indexing and coding projects. Google has even wormed its way into academia funding numerous research projects that deal with high-tech issues and, in turn, winning favorable commentary from academics who might otherwise be skeptical. In reporting on these issues, I found it quite difficult to locate completely independent voices on the topics. Most experts are funded in some way by either big tech firms or their corporate opponents, which goes to show you how thoroughly moneyed interests have captured the civic debate in the United States. Technologies that want to have conversations about economic, political, and technologists want to have conversations about economic, political, and social issues uh, on their own terms, or not at all. The bottom line is that these companies have manipulated the system to ensure that they can continue to operate freely without the burden of pesky government intervention. The result is that they all too often exist in a universe of their own, not just outside of national borders, but somehow transcending borders altogether. It is in this spirit that Palantir's Peter Thiel, uh, Thiel and other powerful tech entrepreneurs and investors have suggested that California secede from the Union. Thiel once funded a plan for a network of floating islands that would operate outside of U.S. government jurisdiction. While he and other tech billionaires 
maintain hideaways in New Zealand. In the meantime, Big Tech itself, like Big Finance before it, has controlled the narrative, using complexity to obfuscate. I cannot tell you how many conversations I have had with fast-talking technologists who try to throw as much jargon against the wall as possible to see what sticks. Yet the simplest questions are often the ones that have the most trouble with, that they have the most trouble with. I continue to await a clear answer to the fundamental questions. Are you playing by the same rules as everyone else? And if not, why? Silicon Valley has always had a poor Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand libertarianism underneath its hippie patina. It justifies their sense of freedom from any costly social responsibility for the downsides of their products and services. As Jonathan Taplin, Jaron Lanier, and other Silicon Valley critics have written, the tech titans may tend to vote left, but the strong libertarian bias in digital culture cuts right. There is an 80s style, greed is good, ethos overlaid with the contempt of a youthful generation of CEOs who've never seen government do anything much more ambitious than cut taxes. All of this has resulted in a self-interested and short-sighted disrupt everything mentality. It is much easier, of course, to break things than to fix them. I'll go ahead and read the rest. The new monopolist, the new monopolists, it's big tech and its economic implications. I'll read that part in the next video. Thank you again for your time. This is the book, Don't Be Evil.